Okay, we're back. This is Dave Vellante of Wikibon.org. We are live, VMworld 2011, here in Vegas, Sin City, with uh, two of my squeaky clean colleagues, Brian Reagan, Steve Keniston. You say that after saying Sin City. Thanks for coming on. You know, we don't have time to enjoy Vegas. I know. Uh, running around like crazy. Absolutely right, Dave. Uh, All work. Welcome back. Uh, I think this is my like, hundredth time in Vegas this year. I don't know why, but everybody's having shows in Vegas, so uh, we'll take it. Um, VMworld, 19,000 people, quite an event. We had Rick Jackson on, we're talking off camera. Next year it's moving back to San Francisco, which is uh, definitely uh, a change of pace. But uh, Brian, back at IBM, great to see you as, as an executive in a, in a cloud role. Absolutely, Dave. Great How's to, that going? Great uh, to be back here at Wikibon and, uh, and SiliconANGLE and, um, and theCUBE. Uh, yes, it's, it's uh, 30 days in, uh, learning a lot. Um, really trying to understand, uh, and the reason we're here at VMware is really trying to understand what this inflection point means. As, as more mission critical applications become virtualized, what is that, uh, what are the implications in terms of disaster recovery, business continuity? Uh, I was encouraged to hear uh, Paul Moritz talk about how DR is a, a, one of the most natural use cases for the cloud, and, and we couldn't agree more. So that's that's the business that I'm uh, I'm focused on and running right now. Well, and Steve, you are a, a storage efficiency evangelist at IBM. I right? am. So tell me what that means. So uh, essentially, what I go out and do is I talk about how storage efficiency, both for IBM and for the end user, is really affecting them. What are the key technologies? What are the trends? What should they expect to see from IBM? Where's it coming? What are the different products it'll be either embedded in or how can they acquire it? Where's it going? You know, so Bar Brian and I do some work together about talking about as we make storage efficient in the cloud, how important is that? How do you sell it? How do you promote it? That sort of thing. So Brian, I actually think you're in a great spot. So your scope is uh, disaster recovery, archiving as well? Or? Archiving as well, that's correct. Okay, you're in really good shape. Here's why. Everybody is talking about how the, your applications for the cloud are cloud 1.0. That means it's becoming real, and there's right. money to be made here. Right. right. We actually, we had Siki Jinta on, um, and uh, she's with a competitor at CSC, and she's saying, look, you know, it's a lot of hype out there, but the real stuff is happening, you know, in, you know, these day-to-day -day applications. Absolutely. And DR and archiving are right, are right there. So, what are you guys seeing uh, in the customer base in terms of adoption, cloud adoption, specifically in those areas? Well, uh, it's, uh, I would break it down into two uh, main areas. One is as uh, in terms of traditional DR, the, the traditional model of I have applications sitting on infrastructure at my primary location, I need a secondary site. So in case uh, Irene or other natural events uh, occur, or if it's just a, a natural downtime event which can occur from you know, data integrity problems or human error and the like. We all know the, uh, the, the reasons why systems and applications go offline. Um, people uh, are naturally starting to evaluate how the cloud can change the dynamics of that disaster recovery model for the better. Cost will come down naturally, um, and maybe they'll get more agility out of their infrastructure. Maybe their, their 24 hour RTO and RPO can come down to six hours if the data is persistent in the cloud as opposed to just at a secondary physical site. So that's sort of use case number one. Um, use case number two, which is related, is very often uh, in the traditional DR model, um, tape was uh, the, the media of choice. We would uh, back up our systems, images, back up our data, put them on trucks, ship them to the, uh, the recovery site, and hope we never had to use them. Um, and very often those tapes would be uh, kept for a very long period of time. Uh, fast forward to the disk-based world of storage, and uh, all of a sudden what we're talking about is uh, an archive use case that first really uh, serves a storage optimization purpose, but ultimately as we start layering in more information management, governance, compliance, search, and discovery capabilities on top of that, um, that obviously expands and extends the value that we can offer to our clients as they preserve that data for long periods of time. So let's dr I want to drill into the cost a little bit, if, and then come back to the optimization piece. Cloud is rental. Right. And rental is almost always, uh, maybe maybe always, more expensive than than owning. Why is cloud less expensive? <clears throat> well, I think it comes down to uh, very similar to a traditional managed service model, where yes, the physical uh, uh, the capa the capital cost is more expensive to rent, um, but the operating expense for rental, I'm, I'm essentially el nearly eliminating the operating expense. 
Um, and as data grows and as the uh, information environment becomes more complex, those op uh, OPEX costs go up. So what we're really doing is we're neutralizing or, or minimizing or almost eliminating the OPEX while perhaps seeing a slight bump in the CapEx. So if I could translate that, uh, uh, a cloud service provider, which you are, is going to do uh, be more efficient at managing infrastructure and Absolutely. be able to pass those savings on to the customer. Um, the point I've been making a lot today uh, is every customer we talk to, almost everyone anyway, budgets are flat, mm -hmm. we're asked to do more with less, headcount is down, is, does that describe your business? That, yeah. Uh, if, uh, it's going our, through the roof, Yeah, right? it, 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 absolutely. If uh, our CFO were here, he'd uh, be talking about how we need to continue to take yeah. costs out of our environment, which well, is you know, why efficiency is absolutely vital to our business. But you're growing, right, provider. is the point. Oh, yes, you're absolutely. Investing. Yeah. So, absolutely. And so the innovation is, the cloud service providers are innovating, they're pouring money into that innovation, right. um, whereas the traditional IT shops are like, okay, keep it flat, right. cut it, it's not our business. Right. And so. Now that brings me to optimization. What, Steve, what's the intersection between what we're talking about here in cloud services and optimization? Um, is it fundamental? Is it a nice to have? Is it a one-time hit? Give us, give us some insight there. I, I think Brian nailed it on the head and you two talking about the economics of it all, right? If, if I'm going to continue to get hammered on, on the economics of running my complete infrastructure and I'm going to sell to the CFO that I'm going to outsource this and I've already sold the fact of the matter that I can actually take the operational cost and extract it from from my, my, uh, my environment, right? Now what am I doing? Okay, the, the, the next question from any CFO I know is what's next, right? So if I can compress it locally, or if I can shrink it locally, or dedupe it locally, or provision it better locally, and become more efficient, and then whatever I do in the cloud, I can get a better dollar per terabyte rate because I'm using less physical space, right? All of a sudden, I'm really now having a much deeper impact on that financial budget. At the end of the day, right, it's really going to come down to finances. And uh, you know we've all witnessed that curve that shows you know this doubling every 18 months, and when they double, they're the most expensive ones. But I need the capacity. Using optimization technology, you don't have to ride that wave anymore, right? You can actually stay behind the curve, wait for the expensive diff prices to fall, be able to put more data and have more capacity available to you without shelling out the money every time you turn around because they need more capacity. So how about pricing? Um, you know, everybody thinks cloud services. You think Amazon. Sure. Swipe the credit card, okay, get a monthly bill for S3 or EC2. Is, is DR is a little bit more complicated than that, isn't it? So what's the pricing model? How's it shaping up? Well, uh, so we do have a few services in our portfolio where you literally can go online to IBM.com and swipe a credit card and download. And that, that typically uh, would serve, for example, a PC or laptop backup uh, type of need. So pricing on that is going to be, you know, as you would expect it to be, somewhere in the five to ten dollars a month, uh, right. you know, per user per seat. Um, DR, on the other hand, um, really takes the shape of. Uh, you know, how much of your infrastructure are we really talking about? It's rarely one server, right? Um, is it a physical or a virtual server? So that's going to change the pricing. Um, is it, uh, you know, what is, are your objectives in terms of recovery? Um, would you like a, uh, you know, very short window of exposure or do, can you tolerate 24, 48 hours of exposure? Um, all of those uh, variables kind of play into uh, both a capacity-based cost, as well as um, there are service costs on top of that. So in the case of a declaration, uh, in the case of a test, um, those tend to be more one-time charges versus uh, ongoing rental charges. Is that a belly-to-belly -belly discussion that, that an IBM sales rep or an IBM channel partner has yes. with, the, with the customer? It, it, so we're not at the point now where we can have that discussion in a way that's standardized across the customer base. Do you, do you see that ever happening, where we can just sort of dial an RTO, RPO? Because people don't know what RTO and RPO is. I mean, Correct. Explain it to them. How much data are you willing to lose? Right. None. Right. Okay, yeah. you willing to pay $500 million? No. Right. Okay, that starts the conversation. I don't know how it ends. You know, so. I, I think, Dave, that what I'm seeing here at VMworld is uh, we are getting closer to that non-belly-to-belly -belly conversation, but it's going to be very workload specific. It's going to be, you know, first in the Wintel and Lintel environments where there are fewer variables in terms of the application sitting on top of them. Um, so we can s let the users sort of self-select into some, uh, you know, online, a little more click transaction type of uh, DR services. But when it comes to the 
I, I need to protect my enterprise, and my enterprise is you know, Revlon or uh, Southwest Airlines or any of these other enterprises that we've heard from, um, they're not doing that by just swiping a credit card. They're, they're designing and really building resiliency into their business from the yeah, ground yeah. up. D Dave, I think what you're seeing, right, is, is this whole notion of RPO and RTO really just changing to a quality of service when you get to the cloud, right? So it's now no longer, you know, what is it? It's here's what I want, how do I get it? And if I can actually get, get a better quality of service because I can move more data more efficiently by optimizing it in some form or fashion, now all of a sudden I've increased my, my, my uh, QoS. And if I can do that and we can be the, the leading cost effective evangelizers of a better QoS for the user, it, you know, this stuff just kind of works now. A lot of it's commodity. I've been walking the show floor. You know, in the old days, you used to have to internet in to go see a demo through. Now this stuff, they show it up, they wheel it on the floor, it just works. So we've gotten past that hurdle. Now it's, I want it to work better. I want it to work smarter. I want it to work more efficiently. And this is what the cloud is enabling, right? Yeah, I think that point about quality of service is a really good one because that allows you as the cloud service provider to package things, guarantee a level of quality right. of service. And maybe it's not just cost plus, maybe it's value. Yeah, as a buyer, I'm happy to happy to pay that. So that's um, that's good. My last question, Steve, is is can things like real time compression actually speed recovery, or is 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 that not the case? No, absolutely right. If you think about if I can actually compress, and let's just hypothetically take a 50% compression ratio, if I can move a file back to my storage over the over the WAN, that's 50% smaller. In theory, I get 50% better performance. So instead of moving a terabyte of data, I'm moving 500 gigabytes. If I'm moving 500 gigabytes, I can move 500 gigabytes faster than a terabyte. That becomes hugely valuable to me, and Excellent. it helps me increase my quality of service. And what did I do? I added a little layer of compression, right? All right, guys, we're out of time. Thanks very much for coming to theCUBE. Uh, Brian Regan, uh, Steve Keniston uh, from IBM. Appreciate you sharing your knowledge and your insights. Great to have you. Thanks, Thanks Dave. Dave.